Hello everybody, I hope you're all doing fantastic today. In this video, I'm going to go over some things you should know, technical things that you should know uh, when shooting, if you're shooting with a DSLR and a lens, and especially if you're shooting with a lower end, cheaper beginner DSLR and a lens, because the things that I'm going to mention, uh, defects, if you can go to that extent that, I'll, that I'm going to mention, are more pronounced with these cheaper lower end cameras than professional cameras that are more perfect. So yeah, if you want to optimize your image quality, you should really know about these things. So yeah, let's get right into them. The first one ironically isn't, you know, going to change your image quality, but you should know about it. And that is that your lens is actually always at its widest aperture, except for when you're actually taking the image. So if you're just looking through the viewfinder, your, your lens is always at its widest open aperture. Now that is also why you don't see your uh, brightness in your viewfinder change when you change aperture and also not your depth of field. Now high end or mid range to high end cameras have a depth of field preview button that you can press while looking through the viewfinder and that'll close your, close your lens down to the aperture set and then you can actually see your, your uh, picture darkening and also your depth of field rendering how it would in your image. So if you want to see how your image is going to look depth of field wise, you can press that button and it'll show you the depth of field. The second one is just really, really important. You should know this from day one, and that is your lens performs the best in the middle and not at the extremes. Now the extremes, you know, I'll, I'll get, you'll, you'll understand in a moment. There's three aspects that I want to talk about. The first one is, you know, your lens's performance frame wise, uh, zoom wise, and then aperture wise. So first of all, your lens is the sharpest and the best performing right in the middle of your frame. The performance goes down around the edges. Your actual light transmission, sorry, your light transmission, you know, the, your, there's a bunch of effects that, you know, are more pronounced around the edges that you don't want. So your lens is the best right in the middle of your frame. Your lens is also right the best right in the middle of your aperture setting range. So your lens is not the best at its widest open, neither is it the best at the uh, smallest aperture. It's the best somewhere in the middle and this is something you just have to experiment with your lens. But with most lenses it's around f8. Uh, and then finally there's another aspect and that is not really proven or much talked about but I think it is true and I think it's true for my zoom lens as well. It's actually not the sharpest at 300 mils all the way zoomed in and I don't think it's the sharpest all the way zoomed out. Um, I sometimes you know find that if I shoot at 300 mil and I zoom just to out a bit to 280 my image is a bit sharper. So your lens isn't the sharpest at the extremes your lens gets softer around the edges um, and your lens gets softer if you have wide open apertures or very uh, closed down apertures. Then another defect that your lens, uh, most cheaper lenses, you know, have is chromatic aberration. Now that is, you know, an effect that you find sometimes where you have a red border or a blue border around your subject. I find this a lot when shooting, you know, photographing the moon because it's a very bright subject against pitch black background. That is the scenarios where the chromatic aberration shows up, you know, the most clearly and also, you know, has the most effect in very high contrast scenarios. Now this is because your optics doesn't do a great job at focusing, you know, the the uh, extremes of the light spectrum which is blue with the longest uh, blue with the shortest wavelength and red with the longest wavelength exactly at the same spot and therefore you get a mis misalignment of those red and blue um, light and therefore giving your subject a red or a blue border. This can be once again dealt with by putting your subject right in the middle because your lens performs the best there 
and also closing down your aperture is likely also going to uh, fix your lens, uh, fix the problem partially. Then, depth of field. Most people will tell you depth of field is controlled by your aperture and only your aperture. But that isn't true and they fail to mention that your depth of field is controlled by three factors. The one is obviously your aperture. The wider, open you, the wider you open your aperture, the shallower depth of field, the more blurry your background will be. But then also it's controlled by your focal length. So the longer focal length you use, the more blurry your background will be, the shallower your depth of field will be. The, sh uh, the, the shorter your focal length, you know, the more depth of field you'll have. And then also distance from your subject also plays a role. The closer your subject is to your camera, the shallower the depth of field will be. That's why with micro, with macro photography, uh, your your depth of field is sometimes like under a millimeter, where if your subject is far away, your depth of field is like three meters. Um, but then obviously your aperture and your focal length has a great great effect on this as well. So if you want. Uh, this is you know quite important to know if you want to create a professional looking image expensive looking image with a cheaper lens that doesn't have a very large aperture that doesn't have a very large aperture so you can cheat this very shallow depth of field look by just using a long uh, focal length lens even though it might not have the widest aperture but then zooming in all the way and then bringing your subject as close to your camera as possible to get the you know sensible framing from that but with your lens all the way zoomed in so as i said the focal length is gives a more if bigger effect than your distance of your subject from the camera so that's why i said zoom in all the way and then bring your subject as close and not zoom in uh, you know bring your subject as close as possible and then zoom in because yeah you should rather have a long focal length i'll put an image on the screen to show you what i talk about when i'm talking about a professional look with actually a cheap lens then the next one uh, next effect that you should know about is focus breathing this is where your camera or your lens or your lens changes focal length um if you change the focus so this is important to know and i'll get to why um so you'll find the effect if you focus all the closest to your camera and then change your focus to the furthest you might see a zoo a little bit of a zooming effect that is focus breathing you find it more with photography lenses because cinema uh, you know video lenses are more designed to not have focus breathing um, because it looks weird when shooting video and you do a focus rack. But why you should know it as a photographer is if you're using some of the outside focus points of your camera, if you use, you know, those points and your lens focus breathes a lot, your camera will try to focus, but as it's, as it's changing focus, your actual subject that you want to focus on moves away from that point because your lens zooms in and zooms out a bit so then if i have found a bunch of scenarios where my camera literally it just can't focus even though it's bright it's not a light issue it's nothing it's just your lens zooms in and out as you change focus and then your camera just can't acquire focus so in that case just move to a closer focus point to the middle of the frame to get you know because in the middle of your frame, zoom doesn't change, move your subject, you know, um, location-wise, it only changes the size of it. So then you can acquire focus that way. So if you have a problem with that, change to a focus point closer to the middle of your frame. Okay, so now we get to things that you should know about your body. Also, just know that your lens is far more important for image quality than your actual body. Most, even the cheap, cheap, cheapest cameras out there have great image quality if you pair them with great lenses. But if you put them with crap lenses, you're going to get crap quality. So the lens is the most important. Now, let's get to the first thing that you should know about your camera. Focus points. 
The focus points that you should use the most is the one right in the middle. This one is the most accurate and this one in many cameras, in most cameras, is cross type. Whereas the other points depends how many, you know, you have that aren't cross type depends on, you know, how advanced your camera is, how expensive it is. The top end cameras, uh, all the points are, you know, of the good ones where the cheaper cameras only the center one is. So your camera might have, you know, more than just one of those good points, um, but you know if you have a very cheap camera only the center one is the great one so i'll get you know explain why the center point in all cameras is um cross type now this is this just means it has more ways of looking at your subject and uh, you know um finding out if it is in focus or not whereas the focus points around the edges of your of your frame isn't cross type and they only have one plane of focus and this could give you problems if you have just lines on your image that you should that you want to try to focus on and if that lines line up with the way the focus point is aligned it can't acquire focus so but a cross type uses multiple dimensions to you know acquire focus so if you want the most accurate, the fastest, the most reliable focus point, use the one right in the middle. And then also for focus breathing reasons. So, but even if you don't have focus breathing in your lens, the focus point right in the middle is the most accurate. Now something to know when you increase your ISO of your camera. Your dynamic range decreases with the increase in ISO. So if you increase your iso of your camera your dynamic range decreases this is something not very well known so it's important to know this um, your dynamic range is your camera's ability to capture uh, detail in very bright parts in the same image as it captures uh, detail in the shadows so if it can you know do very bright highlights and very dark shadows in the same image it has good dynamic range. Whereas if you don't have a lot of dynamic range, it quickly, you know, loses detail in highlights or shadows. Um, so yeah, as you increase your ISO, your dynamic range decreases. Important to know. Then another thing to know with high ISO shooting is the hotter your sensor is temperature wise, the more noisy it will become. So if this is important to know that if you're doing astrophotography if you have two nights to choose from same everything is the same except for the temperature choose the colder night because your sensor will be less noisy in colder conditions than in the warmer conditions if you're doing stacking with your astrophotography and you're shooting a bunch of images maybe increase the gap between those images to allow your sensor to cool down a bit to get you better to give you better noise performance now sensor size is actually more important than megapixels. The larger your sensor is, the larger the pixels is, the more precise it can be manufactured, as well as the more light each pixel can capture. So bigger sensors just mean that you have better dynamic range and usually better low light performance as well. So that's why even a 12 megapixel DSLR with a full frame sensor can far, far, far outperform a cell phone sensor that is 108 megapixels or whatever because it's a lot bigger sensor size. So if you just know that bigger sensors is always more important than megapixels or anything else, the sensor size is very, very important when you know thinking about image quality then if you don't know about this there's a technique to decrease the noise in your image and this is called stacking but it's quite limited because you should have uh, a stationary image your you should be able to capture a, a few images that look the exact same nothing should be moving in your frame so then you have software that uses all those images compare them to find out what is noise and what is real data in your images and therefore you can you know decrease your noise or completely eliminate them depend on the technique you use you know the software use 
and just you know the amount of data you give it so if you capture 100 images you'll you know be able to eliminate any noise if you only give the software two images it'll just you know be able to decrease speed by a bit so if you have noisy images and you have something stationary you can use stacking to decrease the noise okay and then there's another defect that you should know about especially when shooting models or uh, architecture this is called moray i'm not sure if i'm pronouncing that correctly but it's an effect where the patterns in your image lines up or almost lines up with the pixels in your camera and then you get a kind of a rainbow effect in your image on specific spots where that alignment occurs so you might find that with clothing uh, and as i said with buildings maybe with um, what's that shading nets some anything with patterns you might find more right now there are two things you can do you know to try to eliminate this the first one is you can change your aperture in your lens to make your lens a bit softer so open it up more or close it down more to make your lens a bit softer so that it blurs that pattern just enough to eliminate that alignment um, and then also you can go closer so to increase the resolution of your camera compared to that pattern or you can also move away you know just to give that the the to to make the patterns um different sizes so that the alignment doesn't occur um so they, they that's the two in-camera techniques you can use but then also you can use adobe lightroom or photoshop or i'm sure there's other softwares that has tools in them to also decrease the more effect and then finally something to just increase your image quality by just tons is shooting raw so raw is just the file format that your camera writes to your sd card if you shoot raw it captures all the data that it you know captured on your sensor and it captures it in the file now when you shoot jpeg that you that's you know the other file format that you can choose in most cameras it you know takes what it decides um, and just writes that to the file to the to the file on your sd card so that is enough in many cases but in many cases you want more dynamic range um, and you want you know better um, adjustability with exposure and you can also change your white balance when you shoot raw is but not with a jpeg file you can't really change your white balance that much then you get weird weird effects so if you want to really increase your image quality or your ability afterwards um, shoot raw so that's the video um, apply these techniques to um, be able to eliminate or kind of just limit the effects of you know these weird defects of your system um, to get the best image quality from your lower end dslr so yeah i hope you enjoy this video thank you for watching and i'll see you in the next video have fun shooting